So hello guys, this is Sarah Colata from Architecture Talk Tank. Uh, today I have two incredible, well now friends, <laughs> um, who I invited because we, want, we were meeting recently on a call. We're discussing subjects of how architecture and the industry of architecture, so as the business of architecture and management of offices is going to transform post-COVID. And um, with the background and the expertise here, I think that we can have quite an interesting debate about this. So thank you so much, guys, for meeting me on this call. I'll let you introduce yourself properly and say a little bit also about the business that you're running. Okay, uh, my name is Alexandra Poposka and I'm an architect here in Vancouver, BC, Canada. Um, together we started this company called Defined that uh, originally was um, conceived to help connect architects and prospective clients. Um, this it, it, it became a, it came up as a need once we moved out here from across the country and we realized that it's the architects don't really have many networks other than by word of mouth to begin with when trying to connect with new clients or find um, new niches of work um, so that's where we started and uh, i'm daniel i'm not an architect but i'm married to one um and kind of the the project and or I guess company has expanded out to looking into how architects are running their businesses. So we started originally around business development, uh, but looked into kind of the other aspects of networks and how architects are building their firms. Um, and uh, in all this COVID-19 changed a lot. Sorry, one second, let me just change my... Um, and it, and COVID-19 really changed kind of how architects are sit, uh, uh, could potentially come out of this. Um, so we're so what we're now moving towards, not just as kind of business development, but as coaching architect firms and putting together kind of a program to help them run better businesses um, as, as we move forward. Yeah, it's great. And one of the things that I really love how you define it is you talk about the next generation of architects that will come out of it. And how do you, like, how do you structure the definition around this or maybe what kind of point um, you think that will like influence that change mostly in terms of like business and how business will be conducted within architecture. Well, I was just always talked about like after the last recession, there was a, like most of the large new firms have come out, um, and there was a. You can explain a little bit more. Yeah. Um, well, where where I studied and where my career started was in Toronto, Canada, um, and a lot of the firms there that most of my peers and myself were aspiring to work for actually had started right after the big recession in the 1980s when architects were struggling to find work and jobs and so a lot of the talented architects at the time started their own firms more as almost like a hobby like they weren't even making a lot of money but they gathered their friends and began these firms and they grew into what now are these great firms in the city so it was kind of unintentional and it came out of a really a big change in how architects were working and how they could find work. Um, so we see that maybe maybe right now this is the beginning of a similar similar kind of situation. From an economic standpoint, I think we're, we're, we're like we're not quite there where firms are like I think firms are still as busy as ever. Um, even for, like most construction hasn't stopped, but we're starting to see kind of the potential of like a, a financial collapse. But on the flip side, what I think we are also starting to see is empowered teams working from home um, and a change of the office. And I think that's gonna significantly change um, how architects need to run their offices. And I think there's going to be tools and platforms of um, like, w if you're working on a remote team and everyone's everywhere, why can't it be international? Or why can't it be across the country? And I think that this is, these are gonna be the things that um, as architects start their next firm, they might start to look at is like, okay, well, we moved to Vancouver, but we have friends in Toronto. Why don't we, why can we start an office across the country that's two people? Um, and I think those are the things that like, we can start to see potential change for. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, it's uh, it's really valid point that out of like big turbulences, whether it's economic or even political, there's always a change coming. And architecture has been responding to it, like with design, with new concepts. And I even recently spoke with, with an expert who said that like people just get bored of what it's like if there is like if it, when there was modernism, people just needed something new and then postmodernism came. And 
I think that this change has also like kind of lit the light, you know, this is head being like, wow, well, I, you know, I'm benefiting from this in these new ways. Um, so it can really reinvent the way I am practicing. Um, and I know that a lot of it is going to be dependent on the way that we adapt to the new tools, new technology available to us, because a lot of experiences can be translated. Some experiences cannot be replaced, but I think that life can be made easier uh, by digitalization. Um, so can you elaborate a little bit on that? Like how do you, or did you maybe look in your research uh, into these aspects and how do you see it practically evolve? Because I think that the point that you're making of architects moving into this new realm and reinventing the practice um, is very valid, but they will have to adapt to certain new lifestyles, especially with the work. So I kind of adapted to, like I, I've, I've worked the last eight years in the health, uh, healthcare technology, but like in a tech company, uh, which we built up. and. Um, one of the things that became really clear for that was um, the ability to still work in a collaborative environment, um, and, but everyone kind of working on their own sort of projects and working on new tools. So tech, you know, it, they all build, they're, they're, they've adopted the most new tools because they build it for themselves, for problems that they have. Um, but a lot of the tools have built to be quite universal and can be translated into other industries quite easily. So we've actually started to look in and build out kind of like a 101s on just how to set up new tools, collaboration tools. Like our, our company is completely virtual um, and we're a complete remote team. And so we get to actually play around with new, new things. Like for example, uh, instead, of, instead of actually having a meeting to go through a presentation or to like discuss something, we just create a Loom video, takes 10 minutes and then share it with everyone. Doesn't take the time of us all having to like get onto a meeting, it not working, all of the other things gives us the time to connect. And then maybe the next day we'll go and we'll meet and discuss it. And so I think there's like, there's a mixture of a new set of technology with that just like has recently only gotten to a stage that we're capable of working remotely within the last couple of years. But also the fact that I think also we've gotten like new technology, but uh, a new system of like how to use said technology. So what we're starting to see is like, and I think it, it follows from tech. So techs, you know, probably three, four years ahead of uh, more advanced. Um, and we're starting to see these things starting to be adopted in other places. And I think that adoption is going to start to become more rapid where we're seeing software companies coming from tech into the AEC industry. Uh, Monograph's like one company that I really admire about how they've, what they're starting to do uh, with kind of, uh, I guess, they're, they're focusing on like uh, the back end, back office of architecture firms. And I think they're doing a really good job of creating like an, a user experience that rivals any other tech software out there. Um, but it's those sort of things is that you're not like currently most of the tools that exist that are architect centric tools are still clunky non cloud solutions that are, you know, because that's fine like that and that's the same thing we had in healthcare um, and so you actually need a new set of tools to adopt you need to understand you actually and you need a community of people who are using those tools because it sucks to adopt a new tool every time it's it's a, like it's it's a headache and you need to talk to other people who are going through that headache to figure out how they're using it so i think we're at the infancy stages of it but i also think that like as we get better at adopting we'll um, you'll start to see firms have a and the employees and firms kind of expect a different working environment where, you know, they're not tracking their hours in Excel spreadsheet. Um, but they're, you know, they have a software that, you know, they are working on a task and it automatically tracks what they're doing. And at the end of the day, they can just send it off or um, ways of like communicating with their clients that are not, you have to necessarily go on site, but you can do a Zoom call. And you can have the same type of meeting and go through the same documentation. But all of these need systems and all of these need like a, pro a process that's um, appropriate. And I think uh, we're still at the stage of understanding what those processes are. So it sounds to me like because of the stage of infancy within all of this, it's really like people should be encouraged to use whatever technology is already there and actually also kind of give feedback on what could be improved, especially if it comes to architects, because 
you know, even with Zoom, like it allows you to share a screen, do presentations, but perhaps not to transfer a heavy file. And sometimes it would be great to just be able to have it all in once. And of course, most of these things are mostly for like tech people, but uh, we see more and more of integration, um, especially with businesses like yours, for example. And so also what I'm doing really, it's kind of an integration cross-disciplinary between architecture and also to fulfill other needs. I think that the first generation technology was all based upon it all being in one spot and that created yeah. very clunky systems and the technical can because the technology didn't really adopt to creating new things very rapidly self sign on systems that you could just plug in your credit card and st or try something for free were not as like as common and i think that today now everything is very api driven so they're all interconnected and they should be able to work so when we look at uh helping organizations build out their tech stacks and like the tools that they're using and their systems it's making sure that they're integrated but use 10 systems but have a flow about how you use those systems so that it makes sense and you know and i think there's you might reduce it down but i think you know, you don't want to go too far where you're using maybe 20 or 30 systems to communicate and you don't know whether or not email or Slack or Teams or however you're going to chat. Um, but I do think having a system that would be like, okay, look at the Dropbox file or using a, like a Miro to when you're showing a whiteboard so you can all see where you are on the same screen. Um, the collaboration tools. I think one thing I, I, I was talking to someone about this yesterday is I think software engineers are actually quite similar to architects. Um, I know you went to school with, in the architecture. Uh, architecture was in engineering, right? Yeah, well, structural engineering. Was structural engineering. So I think the actual mindset of people who go into it, while they're artistic and like they have that sort of dream, um, there's still this like the like I'm gonna say introverted view it's on. Like, driven. Yeah, and like project. Mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on this one project and I can do it all myself. And so software companies spent a long time building out offices that were open environments to break down those barriers and build out communication. Um, and then software companies then built out a ton of tools to help collaborate because they wanted remote teams and they wanted to reduce their costs. And they wanted to work with teams in India and uh, Canada and South America, like all around the world on projects. And I think that that's, what I think is interesting is if you start to think like that, you could adopt those same technologies in the architecture space uh, with the same mindset. I don't think it will be, I don't think it'll be impossible for architects to, or too difficult to adopt. Uh, there are definitely softwares that you guys use that other groups can't, but um, I think the mindset of still being able to collaborate or focusing on firms being like, we're going to build collaborative environments online uh, is going to be a key success point for firms to really win in the future. Yeah. That's, that's my view. I don't know. Like, like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I really like in how you're explaining uh, and comparing kind of the, you know, system, systematic approach to both like software development and techie things as well as architecture. And I think that within the complexity of like delivering a design, and building projects also managing the project and finances we actually like for the last 15 20 years we needed software um for it so there's already been quite a close collaboration between like software developers and tech and architecture to fulfill all those like tiny problems that we had along the way like you know how do we actually design and draw plans where we can like erase a line that we didn't want to draw there like before we did it by hand and it was so much longer of a process and then, you know, AutoCAD came about and then that software was just all improved. Now we have also like um, project management software out there and things like that. And I think like going back to that first conversation we had in regards to like advancing to be this like new a new architect, right? Like the next generation. I think it's very much about like actually integrating and testing um, and also being like very receptive to the new problems that we're facing. And being able to respond to it being like hey this needs to get solved uh because today we find ourselves in a situation where like we literally have to adapt everything we did before into digital 
and it was like a super unexplored terrain. So a lot of aspects of it were, were not thought of before. And we're finding it on you. And it's like really interesting because people are like discovering whole new methods of working with this, but then also new problems are arising from it. And I think that it's important, like if we are to move ahead to like note, take a note of it and like kind of start discussion about these things so that we can find new solutions to this. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, in all of this, it's really interesting how that affects not only the way we, uh, we actually like, coordinate with the with our ability to move digital but also how we adapt our business model as well as like management of teams and i know that you you're really interested in this and you kind of research that and talk about this a lot so how do you see that happen really like you know you mentioned that like the business models right now mostly in architecture are very founder centric um what is uh, like what is the what is the future is can, can that model be somehow shaped taken up by the reality we're in today? Well, um, you brought up earlier uh, the, the problem of, well, the problems being solved gradually by software as the needs arose. Um, what I found in my experience working at various architecture firms is that when you're not really pushed by a big new change, like the, these problems come up, but you sort of, in a firm, people are resistant to update their software or to change or anything that's not working perfectly. And so, for example, the, my current office for years struggled with bad software, with everybody complaining and working with the software developers to try to fix bugs, reporting them, but for years and years and years. And now since this happened, um, I just heard that they're finally moving to a new software. <laughs> so it's what it took. And also for for the last few years, I've, I've inquired about working part-time or working remotely, and they just say, we don't do that. We just don't do that. It hasn't worked in the past when we've tried it one time, and so we don't do it for anybody. But now everybody's doing it. Everyone's forced to, and they're, adopt, they're using tools like Slack that they've never heard of before, but now they're forced to. So I think it sometimes takes a big, big change to shift management, to shift the tools that you're using. Just like now, and I think from that sort, of like from that sort of view, it, it kind of it changed the bar for everyone. So like when everything went digital, uh, it wasn't that architects had less work; they actually just had more work in a digital environment. And I think that with this, it's not that you're going to have less like work; it's just it's going to be a different environment. I think one of the things about it is is that ninety percent of architecture firms are less than five people, or like five architects within that firm. So they're they're small. Um, and I think the problem that comes up with it is that um, they all have very different processes and how they, how they move along. And I think that, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. When you think about design, it's, it's, it's like you limit yourself so that you can really expand what your options are, right? And it's like, it's by dealing within those limitations that you can really showcase your skill set and your strength. And I think that thing, that trying to figure out how to run an office compared to how to design a building are very different. So if you had, and I will say like the rate that technology is changing and expectations that are changing from a consumer point of view are like, they're fast. Like it's, it's quite amazing how fast, from a like uh, from a client's view, we we adopt new technology and we're comfortable with it. Um, thinking about the fact that like I don't know, Martin Hoon's I guess 15 years, uh, but like it's not been that long for us to have a piece of device that we could not live without. Like, and so if you think about that on on a scale of architect firms, like you have firms that you know started like 20, 30 years ago. Um, never built on around a mobile platform but i would could imagine in the next five ten years the concept of all your interactions with your client being by a mobile and buying a smartphone and so how do you think about that and, and i think that's because in most industries that's changing like how you see people go to websites it's mostly mobile now how people are buying items i think so the thing about it is, is that when you're running small firms it's really hard to adapt new technologies to it um, so one of the companies I think is like really interesting in this space, different, not architects, but I think showcases like what has been very successful as a company, it's a Canadian company called Shopify. And they basically came forward and were like, there are thousands of small vendors and they're not able to like buy stuff online as easily. And so we're going to build out the entire system process. And then all you have to do is 
like plug in a little bit of information about yourself and you can sell online like within minutes. Like it's very, very easy to set up. But what that enabled was like thousands and now potentially millions of people to set up their own shops and have a back office that is a system so that they can just focus on what they do, which is bringing value by find, like by sourcing the right products and that sort of thing. So I think that with architects, if you had like a back office that was set up, that was simple for small businesses and help them kind of put together that environment. Now, knowing everything is slightly different and I don't think you could set it up as simply as like a Shopify system, but at least having it like, these are a set of tools that will get you to a level that, uh, won't compete with large firms, but will make you feel like you're a very professional firm in the modern society, uh, in a, in a digital world. I think firms will be a lot better suited. Uh, like we've, we, you know, we've talked, looked at, like you've looked at websites and we've talked like in the past, we've talked about how like architects, it's all word of mouth. That is one area to change, but I do think how they communicate with their clients, whether or not Slack, Zoom, all these sort of things, these technologies are going to adapt. And I think that our COVID-19 is going to also in, extremely um, uh, impact clients where you have a generation of people like, I think the thing I find fascinating is like my parents are now having Zoom calls with their friends. Like the concept that like my my dad who doesn't like hate wants everything printed out on paper and like draws in meetings and that's like his whole thing. He's having Zoom calls with his friends to be like that is a that's how he wants to like he's very comfortable with communicating. And that enables like a neck so that means that someone who's not going to be happy with that as being a communication is now going to be happy with it, which is then going to mean that like clients can are going to start to expect a, a digital firm because if you are so outdated that you're still doing only in person meetings, like that's a super significant cost to me. And what other sit like why are you so behind on time? So I think that that's where firms need to like the new normal, which I don't like the term, but like I think the new baseline for firms has just moved up a lot and i don't think and it, it's totally understandable that firms are not quite ready for that because no one is um but i think that um that's going to be a, a good challenge that the industry is going to face mm -hmm. uh, moving forward but also now that a lot of these firms are going to get a taste for of how much easier the processes of doing a lot of these things are like communicating on a mobile or using any of these tools, I think they're they're going to want to adopt these. I think the employees are going to want to adopt it. Yeah. I think that the founders of the firms, I think founders of firms, like I've run my own, like running your own company, it sucks to adopt new technology. And like every time, like I understand why there's always attrition to doing it because it's mm -hmm. like startup costs, it's a new thing. Like we're, like, you know, to pay for Slack, to pay for all these things they're not free. Like, that's the other thing. Like we kind of think, okay, going digital is it, it's inexpensive in general, but like 20 subscriptions to a certain platform, they, they are 40 or whatever, how many tools you use, they, they do add up. But I do think this gets to the point of like employees are getting empowered. Employees are now in arch and architects and firms are going to be able to be like, well, I could re work remotely for another firm and do and get paid the same work from home and have a better lifestyle. Like all of these things can potentially change where I do think that like this could be an empowering of the employees, but then a firm would push it. But I don't think it's going to be driven by the, I don't think it's going to be driven by sometimes, the sometimes founders. Sometimes it would be, sometimes it could be driven by the founders if they see that there's a lot of time saving, yeah. for example. Yeah, that's true. Um, I worked at one firm where we recorded all of our hours on a Excel spreadsheet for every project and we manually made the sheet like a calendar for every month entering the days and it was unbelievable how much time it just took to set up this stupid sheet to record your hours instead of using a tool that was already out there for me like time management yeah. so it, there was a lot of resistance in adopting a, an online time management tool for the team but in the end they saw that it actually saved the money even though they paid a subscription because it just there were so many employees that they were paying a salary to to use a clunky slow tool versus just paying for a subscription yeah so i feel like this is this right now tinkering with and exploring all with all these new tools is going to open up a lot of people's eyes as to how much time they could save and even though there's a cost an initial cost associated with a lot of these they'll realize that it's a, it could be a cost saving 
Yeah. I think the thing, I, 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 it's, it's always difficult for firms, I, I, for any company to buy, to buy something compared to use resources you always have. So having someone spend two hours on something, even if it's two hours at like $30 an hour and that's $60, even like, I know firms, like I, I know the feeling of, oh, well, would I pay $5 a month to save that two hours? Now, like rationally, of course, you should be able to do that. But the decision of that transition is not always like, is not always easy. But I do think, hope, yeah. like, I do think there's going to be a change with this and there's a push. And so it's part of it is helping. Like, so our, our, what we're looking to do is when we, we're starting to push out some content about uh, tools that exist, um, we've got about 50 uh, tools that we're, we're now like writing little write-ups about kind of how, what they are, how to set them up, all content that is already online um, and kind of some tips and tricks. So we're trying to like produce some content to help out uh, firms just to know about these tools that exist uh, and then they can kind of make their own decisions about how they best suit them uh, as they move forward. Yeah. Third delay. Hello? Hey, I lost you for a minute. Oh. <laughs> there was a thing that just froze. <laughs> it's oh. like sitting and waiting for it. To Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, it's still kind of freezing, but um, can you hear me well? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, now it froze. I wonder how long. I don't think it's us, though. We're still. No, we're still good. Hmm. Oh. No, Hi, oh, there we go. I, I had frozen for us. Just restarted completely. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's all right. We're okay, still recording. I'm, yeah, that's good. I'm going to re edit it. That's fine. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, there's two things I'm kind of picking up from it. Like, I think that it's a hard topic because, all in all, and I don't want to generalize or criticize, but like, it's just the reality. Like, architecture is quite a stubborn and like traditional uh you know industry and people are loving their methods of doing things even if they learn like in a different generation they very often will stick to just like a pen and a paper and if new technology comes up like you say there is a lot of aspects that come to it like it can be the cost for sure it can be actually just transitioning your uh, your staff and understanding that it's going to take them time to like really get their head around the new software or whatever new um, you know the change that is implemented and sometimes that can be that scary to, like and and maybe even to find time to actually implement it like when you have projects and so many other things that are like pressing um, how do you really like disconnect from it and say you know that change is that important we actually have to take that step and so I think that. Um, you know, the reason, I mean, it's, there is not like a really either no, not an advice nor a solution to it. It's more, I think people need to be aware of the fact that we're doing this. Us as architects, we're doing this and a lot of times we're being stubborn to change. And then comes this big change that is like kind of like hitting us like a shock. Um, and then, yeah, we're adapting because we're problem solvers. We frankly kind of live by, <laughs> by you know, making decisions that could, that could solve and better and envision and better, etc. Um, so um, a lot of it is just staying agile and adaptable. I, I wouldn't say like, so I, I totally agree. I, I don't think I, I, you could say a lot of industries don't change and are slow to adopt. Like I can, and the top of my head, like I've just, you know, like lawyers, <laughs> teachers, like public health, everyone no like very few or like systems actually like to change because as soon as you get to a spot you're running a good business why do you want to change things uh, so i don't think it's something that architects need to like should be okay they're not doing a good job about it i just think i i think the key thing is like totally being empathetic to the fact that this change is happening and how are you going to deal with it and how like what's the best way to move forward with it? Is it through your employees uh, and, you know, empowering them to like, we're going to try new collaboration tools for the next couple of years or a year or month. And I need your feedback to see if these work. 
Um, I think that part of it comes from my view about it is it's like our, a large part of this is the as a change from it will be as how they're structured and how they see it, like the hierarchy within firms. Uh, because I think that change comes, if you just push change from the top, it will very rarely happen. But if change is happening as a system approach, I think that would work well. Um, but I think that it's like, a, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I, I think that like one of the things, I think that's where, it's it's been interesting within the community, at least like you know, I've been talking to like the architect marketing community, and they all talk about you know websites aren't great, and like architects don't know how to do this and that, and it, they just weren't trained. Like I I came from healthcare tech, and man, they are like they're potentially a lot worse <laughs> than architect in a lot of the ways that they run their businesses and how they do things. I think some of the differences are like they were just pushed sooner by other entities. So like the entire healthcare industry became electronic because the government came forward and said, you guys have to be electronic. If, if, if like the government hadn't said, we're going to spend billions of dollars around the world to make the healthcare industry electronic, the healthcare industry would not be. And so I think that like the architects need to kind of, there has to be a realization of like that it is hard to move that direction. Um, but the firms that are able to adapt faster towards it, will have an advantage. And I think that's the other, that's the side. And so you don't have to do it all at once, but it will help your firm from an operational and a positional standpoint to be able to be a, like a much more digital firm um, and to take on new challenges like what's going on today. Sure, definitely. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, this is like a really good takeaway to, um, you know, I recently shared a, an article as well on social media and it was like really popular and it said that if you, you know, that the companies that like adapted to uh, like new technology 20 years ago, now they're like doing really well. And these companies that will now adapt to the new realm of like doing business and the technology that comes with it will, will do really well in the next 10 years. And so, you know, it's just a concept, but I think there is a lot of truth in it. And, uh, you know, a big part of being, you know, a good business person is also to, to actually navigate through these um, times of crisis and also how you make decisions. Um, so I think that this is like a really good takeaway from this conversation. Um, so I just wanted to ask you um, back to your business. Uh, you are connecting architects with projects and making it easier for clients to find an architect. Um, how do you think that this process will change? Is it gonna change? Um, you know, with everything that's happened now, I think people are so much more aware of like, maybe concepts like lead generation or, you know, generally like just being online and having an online presence. So how do you think that is gonna affect well, for one, if, if we're limited suddenly in our face-to-face -face interactions and face-to-face -face networking uh, opportunities, we're going to be forced to find other ways to, to connect and, and find our client, prospective clients and prospective projects. Um, I, I was at an architecture talk a few months ago before all of this happened. And it, was, it had a focus on marketing in architecture firms. and. The main message was get out there, meet people in person, go to conferences, go to events, hand out your business card, talk in person. None of this suddenly applies. <laughs> this was what the profession is telling all of its young architects is the way that you find projects. So suddenly everyone's going to be like, well, what do I do now? Um, originally, we, were, we, we identified the, that being a problem when it came to, for example, as an architect moving across the country. If you ran your own firm, for example, how do you even start again when you don't have all of those contacts? And I think that, so what we've looked at, and like to add to that is I think that it does change. We're, we're still not quite sure how it's going to change. Um, I think that, you know, so we, we were aiming to launch in the spring, but then COVID-19 happened and it was like, people aren't really looking to start new projects and that sort of connection right now. So we've, we've pivoted a little bit um rethink taking a step back and rethinking the process 
what we're trying to offer and how this fits in. But the, the order of the things that you're trying to offer. Well, that and, and, yeah. and, and, and think, rethinking a little bit about like the systems. We, I think, I'd originally, well, we'd hoped that uh, people would be interested in connecting online. And that these sort of things would, you know, you'd be able to still build relationships through people online rather than having to sit in person and having coffee. And I've seen this from, like, I, I just did uh, my MBA. It was all virtual. And, you know, I've got strong relationships in that, in that way. And so we built this, the, the Define platform was built around the concept of matchmaking clients and architects with values and trying to build, like, relationships online very quickly so that you could, so that both architects and clients feel comfortable to jump into a project together, potentially not without having met or in a, in a different environment. Um, so we've looked at kind of how you build those relationships, how, like looking at, you know, tools, like, yeah, dating tools and such, and seeing like what systems that they have put in place. Um, I think that there's still like, we're, as I say, we're not in the market yet, so we're still not quite like, there's going to be some interesting to see how they, uh, it's going to be adopted. Um, there are tools that exist like house and such. And I think those, there's going to be a bigger push towards those, those platforms. But what, what we found is that those platforms were not really driven around values or value, like what the architect was bringing to the table. They were mostly built on kind of five-star reviews and images and we felt that architects there's a deeper sort of connection about the architect and the firm themselves and so to like how can we uh build that within the platform so um those are the things that we're still kind of working towards but i do think that um you're gonna start to have people the first there i, I think you're still gonna always have the network um and that you're always going to ask your friends but i think you're going to how you build those first relationships being able to do it online and that sort of thing i think will have could be a larger sort of thing and so we're looking at how we can kind of implement processes like potentially integrating into systems like zoom so when you're meeting you can open up it like you'll send an automatic zoom link or something like that um so that we can fit into this new process and enable architects to change their process uh with that regard in that regard Excellent. I'm looking forward to see it <laughs> work. And uh, yeah, it's it's great. I think they used to put some more content out there about this as well, because, uh, you know, it's, I mean, I think you have a point with the fact that perhaps a lot of firms are not looking for projects, but then again, like right now I see people building, like I'm actually staying a lot in the countryside and, um, yeah, there's builders on, you know, there's like just a little um, field and they're just building a house and maybe it's five builders, they're working and we're actually like quite strictly on the lockdown in Poland. Um, so, you know, it's like, I, and, and funny enough, actually, they, they keep like all the building suppliers open because people are like renovating their kitchens and whatever. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, yeah, like perhaps just i don't i'm not saying that there would be a, a high heightened need for it um but i think that things are still happening and just like communicating that could help the people that are doing it actually find the client the, the architects that could help and yeah. kind of like where you guys are at so it could yeah. be really um it could be really good i yeah uh, yeah so <laughs> thank you so much actually for for showing up uh, with the baby as well and uh yeah, having this lovely conversation with me. <laughs> thank you. Hello. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah. I was just going to add to that. Um, definitely, we see that there there will eventually be a need for these uh, for our hiring architects and for finding projects. But we just feel like at the moment, these couple months, there seems to be a bit of uncertainty and a pause, which is the reason why we switched our focus a little bit more. But we definitely foresee the rise of that. And here as well, construction has continued and everybody is still going to the hardware stores and buying supplies. And I think the longer we spend in our homes, the more we, f we find problems that we need to fix <laughs> because that, that we've been putting off. At yeah. home, exactly. Mm -hmm. For sure, yeah. Yeah, it'll yeah exactly. Well, thank you, Sarah. It was very nice chatting. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, it was amazing. Thank you guys. Really appreciate the time and all the 
super interesting things that you shared. Um, so if people are interested to find you after this conversation, where do they go? Uh, our website's defined.co, D-E-F-I-N-D.co. Um, and we're, uh, we just released our um, work from home toolkit. Uh, that's going to be on our site and we're going to be starting to push out more advice and content uh, in the coming weeks and months and hopefully uh, launching some stuff in the next couple months as well uh, or next couple weeks. We'll see how, as, we, as, we're, as we're moving along. Amazing. Brilliant. So check defined.co and thank you guys so much. Thanks, Sarah.